Brothers and sisters, welcome to the Disability and Jesus Sunday service for today, the 29th of August, almost the end of the school summer holidays, clearly from the weather outside my window anyway, the end of summer, and we look forward towards autumn and the season of harvest and of mists and mellow fruitfulness. But let's have one last Sunday of summer uh, as we gather together today. We gather together but we are apart, and that's part of the charism of our community of disability and Jesus, that we worship apart together, and that we know that we're part of one another. Even if we're separated physically by distance, we are united by love and the Spirit of God. So we pray that today this service blesses you, encourages you, feeds you, nurtures you, and upholds you. In the faith that we share. You are very welcome and we're glad to be here. Our prayers of penitence, a time to pause and confess those things which are not right with the world and in our lives. In a dark and disfigured world we have not held out the light of life. Lord have mercy. In a hungry and despairing world, we have failed to share our bread. Christ, have mercy. In a cold and loveless world, we have kept the love of God to ourselves. Lord, have mercy. May the God of love bring us back to himself, forgive us our sins and assure us of his eternal love. In Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Let us pray. Almighty God, you search us and know us. May we rely on you in strength and rest on you in weakness, now and in all our days, through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Mark chapter 7, verses 1 to 8, 14 and 15, and 21 to 23. The Pharisees gathered around Jesus. So did some of the teachers of the law. All of them had come from Jerusalem. They saw some of his disciples eating food with unclean hands. The Pharisees and all the Jews do not eat unless they wash their hands to make them clean. That's what the elders teach. When they come from the market, they do not eat unless they wash, and they follow many other teachings. For example, they wash cups, pitchers, and kettles in a special way. So the Pharisees and the teachers of the law questioned Jesus. Why don't your disciples live by what the elders teach, they asked. Why do they eat their food with unclean hands? He replied, Isaiah was right. He prophesied about you people who pretend to be good. He said, These people honour me by what they say, but their hearts are far away from me. Their worship doesn't mean anything to me. They teach nothing but human rules. Isaiah 29 verse 13 You have let go of God's commands and you are holding on to teachings that people have made up. Again, Jesus called the crowd to him. He said, listen to me, everyone. Understand this. Nothing outside of a person can make them unclean by going into them. Evil thoughts come from the inside, from a person's heart. So do sexual sins, stealing and murder. Adultery, greed, hate and cheating come from a person's heart too. So do desires that are not pure and wanting what belongs to others. And so do telling lies about others and being proud and being foolish. All these evil things come from inside a person and make them unclean. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. We hear so much these days about the idea that 
image is everything. It's not so much about what's inside the box that's important, it's the packaging that sells the product. And that's been true for many years, but it seems to be increasingly true as time goes on. Thousands of millions of pounds are spent every year by companies on advertising and packaging their products and services to encourage us to choose them above the competition. But it's not just products and services which are packaged, it's people too. People who are standing for elections or going for promotions or trying to project a particular persona, they often have image consultants who advise them on what's best to wear in public and private, just in case they happen to be seen, even on such things as how to have their hair cut if they have any left. What was once the realm of movie stars and pop idols seems to have become the world of anyone who wants to get on in politics or public life or almost anywhere, because we're told image is everything today. You'll be aware, of course, that that hasn't pervaded every level and area of society. It clearly hasn't got as far as Vickers, as you can clearly see, but it's very prevalent nonetheless. But for all that, it's nothing new, nothing new at all. If it was a new phenomenon, then it wouldn't be something that we hear Jesus speak about in today's Gospel reading. Jesus was speaking to and about the Pharisees, and the attitude of the Pharisees has found its way into the English language as an adjective, pharisaical, used to describe a person who's hypocritical, particularly in their willingness to judge others for moral weakness. And the word hypocritical itself comes from the Greek and means to play a part, to act it out, not to be real. So there's something about the way we use the word Pharisee to mean someone who's not quite real, someone where the substance doesn't quite match the image. But the word was originally used to describe a movement within Judaism which kind of separated itself from other people in order to really properly and in a focused way live out the law of Moses. The word Pharisee comes from a Semitic root word, peres, which means separate. So Pharisee literally means separated one. And the intention of the Pharisees had originally been a godly one, much like the early desert fathers in the Christian church. They wanted to be separate from, apart from other people, in order better to follow God. That was the intention. The problem was that this original ideal became fossilised, at least for some of them, to the point where it was all about following sets of rules and regulations, and the outward performance of rituals became the important thing, rather than the inner attitude toward God and toward other people. And when Jesus had a go, it was this kind of fossilization of the original intention that he was attacking. They'd lost their way. They'd lost the purpose of why they were doing what they were doing. And human nature being what it is, there's always been the temptation to allow this kind of ossification to happen. Something starts off as a wonderful idea, but before long people turn the idea into a project, and the project into a programme and the programme into a policy, and the policy into a law, whether it's written or unwritten. What started from a good and pure motive to live the right way can so easily become a culture of this is how we've always done things, and pretty soon it can become a set of norms that stultify the very life that we were originally trying to express. It's one of our less endearing traits as human beings. But the sobering thought is that if it could happen to the Pharisees, then it can happen to the church, and all too often it has. This group, or that group, have hived themselves off, separated themselves from the main body of the church, usually because they thought the church had become fossilised, or wasn't doing Christianity properly, 
And so they go off on their own to be the real thing, to be the proper people, to be God's holy remnant, God's chosen ones. And behold, the same thing happens to this breakaway sect. They become fossilized. It's a constant danger. Seems to me that what we have to do as the church, as Christians, is to somehow get the balance right between, on the one hand, openness to the idea that God might lead us in a new direction, which he often does, so that we can proclaim the gospel afresh in every generation, in every context, in every culture. Between that on the one hand, and then on the other hand, a wariness in case we fall prey to every passing fad and fashion of the world and be led astray. Sad thing is that the things that come along in life never seem to arrive with a label attached, saying which is which, so it all gets a bit messy. That's why it's so much easier to give in to the temptation to fall back on fixed rules and regulations, fixed forms of doing things, and then we can abrogate responsibility for deciding what to do. But to go that way is to give up the essential vitality that should mark us out as the people of God. It's to fall prey to the trap that the Pharisees have got themselves into. We have an opportunity every day to decide how we're going to play it, both as individuals and as the church. We can meet the new possibilities and challenges of each day with a closed mind, one which thinks, as the Pharisees had come to think, that it has everything sussed and all will be well if only everybody would just follow the rules and the norms that always used to work perfectly well. It's the kind of view of the world that sees nostalgia through rose-tinted spectacles that harks back to a past that never really was. The alternative is that we can meet the new possibilities and challenges of every day with a mind and a heart which is alive to God, which wants to allow him to be our guide in life, not closing our minds to new things, but considering them, weighing them, discerning them with minds and hearts open to the guidance of the Holy Spirit. And that second way is much more exciting, it's much more vital, it's much more alive. It's the way in which Jesus said we should live so that our outward self is an expression of the joy and peace of believing that we have within rather than simply an outward self that is an expression of playing by the rules, adhering to the culture, doing things the way we've always done things round here where image is everything. The scandal of God's love for us is that he allows us to make the choice about which way to go. He allows us to decide whether to follow his will or not, whether to be open to his guidance or not. He loves each of us enough to give us that choice and to allow us to live it out, or to choose rather to be hidebound by a prison of our own making, whether it's whitewashed or not. He leaves us free to choose but throughout the history of his dealings with his people, God's given us advice again and again about which is the better way to choose. If only we listen and take the risk of trusting him and trusting in his guidance. Of course, famously, there's a piece of advice in the book of Deuteronomy in chapter 30. I call heaven and earth, it says, to witness this day that I've set before you life and death, blessing and curse. Therefore, choose life that you and your descendants may live, loving the Lord your God, obeying his voice, cleaving to him, for that means life to you. God wants us to know life, life in all its fullness. Jesus affirmed that when he said in John chapter 10, verse 10, I have come that they may have life and have it abundantly. God's plan is that we should be like a spring of living water, bubbling up with life and love and light to share with the world, enjoying the good things that he's prepared for us by walking in his way. Our job, very simply, is to say yes to God. 
Jesus' advice to the crowd in today's Gospel reading is very simple. Don't choose the stultifying half-life of fossilised culture and the way we've always done things, but instead be open to God's Spirit. Let God's Spirit animate your spirit. Let him fill you with all joy and peace in believing and help you day by day, moment by moment, to choose life, life in all its fullness. That's the advice that Jesus was giving to the crowd in today's Gospel reading. That's the advice that Jesus gives today to you and to me. So brothers and sisters, let us choose life. Amen. Our prayers of intercession are taken from the Social Justice Resource Centre and the web address is at the bottom of the screen. At the end of each short section of prayer, the line begins, God of, and then describes God in different ways. And the response is, receive our prayer. God commands us through Jesus Christ to love one another. We pray for all continued blessings on peacemakers, on leaders who value peace, and on everyone who promotes non-violent solutions to conflict. We pray for a speedy end to all violence and warfare around the world. God of peace and gentleness, receive our prayer. We pray for the strength of heart and mind to look beyond ourselves and address the needs of our brothers and sisters throughout the world. For the rural and urban poor, for the rebuilding of our communities, for an end to the cycles of violence that threatens our future. God of generosity and compassion, receive our prayer. We pray for all nations that they may live in unity, peace and concord and that all people may know justice and enjoy the perfect freedom that only God can give. God of liberty and freedom, receive our prayer. We pray that the Holy Spirit may embrace the most vulnerable members of our society. We pray for an end to the growing disparity between the rich and poor. And for the grace and courage to strive for economic justice. God of all gifts and blessings, receive our prayer. We pray for all asylum seekers, refugees and pilgrims from around the world, that they may be welcomed in our midst and be treated with fairness, dignity and respect. God of outcasts and wanderers, receive our prayer. We pray for all who have died as a result of violence, war, disease or famine. Especially those who died because of injustice, neglect or hardness of heart. God of eternal life and resurrecting love, receive our prayer. Mighty God, you have promised to hear what we ask in the name of your Son. Watch over our country now. Guide our leaders in all knowledge and truth. Make your ways known among all people. In the passion of debate, give them a quiet spirit. In the complexities of the issues, give them courageous hearts. Amen. Our Father, Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy, thy kingdom. Come, thy will be done on earth as it is 
in heaven. heaven. Give us, Give us this, this day, day our, our daily, daily bread. bread. And forgive us, us our, our trespasses, as we, we forgive those, those who trespass against us. us. Lead us not <clears throat> into temptation. But, but deliver us from, from evil. evil. For thine is, is the kingdom, kingdom the, the power, power, the power, and, and the glory, glory forever ever and ever. ever. Amen. So we ask for God's blessing on ourselves, on those whom we love, and on those who need his help in any particular way. Christ our King, make you faithful and strong to live in his love, and the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, Go with you and stay with you always. Amen.